This month, March 2016, it marks 13 years that Dr. Afia Siddiqui has been wrongfully imprisoned. I emphasize wrongfully imprisoned. She is a political prisoner and a prisoner of war. She is a young woman, she is still young, who came to the United States in 1990. She was 18 years old. She came to the U.S. from Pakistan full of promise, hope, expectation. She was already a very mature and very accomplished young Muslim woman. She was 18. She has a brother who resides in Houston, Texas. And she lived with her brother that first year. And she spent her freshman year at the University of Houston. That freshman year for Afia Siddiqui was so distinguished academically that she ended up receiving a full scholarship to MIT. She went off to MIT in Boston graduated with honors, went from MIT to Brandeis University, where she then, a few years later, acquired a PhD in cognitive neuroscience, a brilliant young person. But there was something more about Afia Siddiqui that distinguished her above and beyond her academic prowess. It was her commitment to Islam. She was a very knowledgeable and dedicated young Muslim woman. There is actually a video of her just before she left the University of Houston for MIT. It's on YouTube. All you have to do is put in her name, Afia Siddiqui 1991, or Afia Siddiqui Houston, Texas, and the video comes up, and she gives this brilliant address, it's about 19 minutes long, on the rights and responsibilities of women according to the Quran and Sunnah, according to Islam. It's a brilliant address. And when the young president of the University of Houston introduced her, he announced that she had already been designated as the Dawah coordinator at MIT even before she got there. This is how far and wide her reputation went. And so she arrives at MIT. She has a very distinguished academic sojourn there that not only involved her teaching about Islam and spreading the message of Islam among her peers and in the community at large and putting together with another family member a charity that brought books into some of the jails and prisons to begin the process of helping to rehabilitate felons. Some of us may remember that in the 1990s there was this eruption in part of the Caucasus called Bosnia. There was an eruption that resulted in terrible, terrible outrages being committed, war crimes, genocide. Afia Siddiqui became one of the voices in the Boston area to raise humanitarian relief items that were desperately needed, boots and coats and other things that were desperately needed by the people in Bosnia who were suffering through a, not just a terrible war, but a bitter, a bitterly cold winter. When I traveled to Boston to talk to people that knew her, one of the most senior imams in the city of Boston. His name is Abdullah Farooq. He joined us 
in Boston three days ago for the rally there and spoke up again for Afia. He said to me, Brother Salakhan, do you remember the Bosnian crisis? And I said, yes. He said, if we were to point to one person who was most responsible for galvanizing the greater Boston area to respond to that crisis as a communal force, it was this young undergraduate by the name of Afia Siddiqui. This is what ended up bringing her under a cloud of suspicion after the tragedy of 9-11, when activist Muslims all over the country were coming under suspicion. Regrettably, when Afia Siddiqui left the United States in 2002 and went back home, that cloud of suspicion followed her. And one day in March of 2003, on March 30th, Afia and her three young children, I emphasize, three young children, ages six, four, and six months, got into a taxi cab. They were on their way to the airport in Karachi to visit a maternal uncle in Islamabad, and they never made it. They never made it. The taxi was stopped, and all four of them were forcibly removed by U.S. and Pakistani agents. And then they were disappeared. On March 30th, 2003, Afia Siddiqui and her three young children were disappeared on the basis of nothing more than suspicion. The suspicion that she was a high-ranking female functionary for Al-Qaeda. It was an absurdity. But one of the most tragic absurdities to this whole story is that within a matter of days or weeks after they were disappeared, U.S. authorities came to a realization that they had made a tragic mistake. But instead of admitting they made a mistake and correcting the terrible thing they had done to this family, they have been in cover-up mode ever since. This is the greatest tragedy. Not just what happened to this young woman and her children. And even if Afia Siddiqui was the person that Uncle Sam suspected she was, what did her children do? Why would they disappear? Her young son, Ahmed, who was six years old, he was not returned to the family's home in Karachi, Pakistan, until five years later in 2008. The young daughter, Mariam, who was just four years old, she was returned to the family's home six and a half years later in, in 2010. And when she was returned to the family's home, she could only speak English with an American accent, which tells us who had her all those years. The youngest child, Suleiman, who was just six months old, he is still missing. And we believe he died in that operation. And the reason why we believe he died is because when young Ahmed, when he was finally returned to the family home, and he was asked what he could remember about that fateful day. He reported that all he could remember was that he and his mother and brother and sister were in a, in a car, they were in a taxi. They were on their way to the airport. He said strangers stopped the taxi and forced them out. And he said he remembers his mother screaming and crying. And he also remembers seeing his little brother, Suleiman, on the ground. And there was blood. What happened was when they were forced out of that taxi, young Suleiman was ripped out of his mother's arms. And he hit the ground. And his skull was probably fractured. 
And again, instead of the United States government and the Pakistani government admitting that they had made a terrible mistake, they had been in cover-up mode, all except for one formerly high-ranking Pakistani official, a former minister of the interior of the Musharraf government, who admitted, admitted to that mistake, to that terrible, terrible mistake, and said this is the worst mistake that he has ever made, and it's one that he will have to live with the rest of his life. Everyone else is still in denial. Afia Siddiqui right now sits on a military base in Fort Worth, Texas, cut off from the outside world. She is a shell of her former self. The reason why we are here is to bring attention, to bring light, and to bring pressure. No one should feel oblivious to this terrible wrong that has been done. As Thomas Jefferson, one of the founding fathers of this country said, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. His justice cannot sleep forever. Afia symbolizes the many other disappeared in this so-called war on terrorism. She is not the only one, but her case as the former U.S. Attorney General Ramsey Clark has said, in his opinion, is the worst case of individual injustice he has ever witnessed. And certainly, in my years of doing human rights work in America, this is the worst that I have witnessed. So with that said, this rally is going to continue with other speakers. We ask you to please remember this woman. Carry her with you. Offer a prayer for her and her family from time to time. But more importantly, in the United States of America, where we do still have the freedom of speech and the freedom of conscience, the freedom of association, and the freedom to act, do something. Do something with what you know. I thank you for listening.